Okay, so um, tonight's talk is going to be about Alephus Levy, and I'm going to just like get this right out of the way. The reason that I'm pronouncing it Alephus Levy is because that that's the phonetic um, transliteration of Alphonse Louis, which is his name, and that's how he kind of made it into a Hebrew version. People can argue with me about how to pronounce it, and I find that to be a completely nonsensical argument, so it doesn't matter. I don't really care how you pronounce it. I just want to get that out of the way so I don't have to argue about this tonight or on YouTube later. Um, the, to really put... Um, Levy was uh, a, a, one of the most influential cultists of all time, really, like seconded only by Alistair Crowley. And uh, Crowley himself believed himself to be the uh, reincarnation of Levy. And uh, I actually, although when I hear claims like that, I tend to be very skeptical. However, I think there are numerous points where you can see that Levy's work is a uh, strong antecedent to Crowley's work, and there are connections that um, uh, I, I'm going to be making throughout this uh, talk. Uh, to understand the context of Levy's work, though, you have to understand um, that he was born um, 20 years after the French Revolution and in France. So, it, it, that, that, and there is no way to really interpret what he was doing without sort of understanding the political context of this. Um, Levy was a strong counter-revolutionary. Uh, he wrote, he was jailed twice for writing counter-revolutionary tracts. Um, he was a political activist as well as being an occultist and as well as being a, a, a writer and a, a speaker. Um, uh, before, and, and also, you need to sort of understand that uh, Levy intended to join the priesthood. Uh, he backed out at the last minute before being ordained. Um, there are numerous stories about why that happened. Uh, some people say he met a woman. Some people say he was doubting himself or doubting the church and, and whatnot. There's really no uh, confirmed story about this because for Levy, we don't have his kind of like personal thoughts and feelings in the same way that we have with certain other occultists. I mean. Uh, we have in these meetings before talked about uh, John Dee, for example, and about how it becomes difficult to study him simply because all we have in his magical records are his personal diaries. Well, this is kind of like the polar opposite problem. We don't have his personal diaries, we don't have his personal thoughts. All we have is the things that he had out there to be published. Um, before the French Revolution, uh, the church owned a great deal of land in France, um, and they were able to put tithes on the people in the state, um, and they had a huge source of revenue that way. Um, this was all of the, after the revolution, all of the church's property became property of the state. Um, monastic vows were considered null and void, so monks and nuns were just kind of chucked out. And this was a really big deal because previous to this, um, it was sort of a tradition that, you're, you know, if there was a third child in a family, they would be sent to either the monastery or the nunnery. Um, so a lot of these people were just like from families that couldn't afford to keep them, and so they had really nowhere to turn. So there was a huge um, outpouring, um, and there was a huge outpouring of anger against the church, um, where people who would even just like be going to mass were getting beaten in the streets for that, and you know priests were executed by drowning on a regular basis. There was a big uproar, and you know there were abuses on both sides. You can't really say that like there are no good guys in this situation, but it was in this climate, and this is what my uh, point in bringing this up is. It was in this political climate where Levy decided to try to get into the priesthood. So actually, where sort of we tend to see um, going into be a Catholic priest as sort of a reactionary thing or a conservative thing, it was actually for him he was going against his society at the time very strongly. Um, one of the people who uh, Levy hated the most was uh, Voltaire, although. He does have a couple nice things to say about him now and then, but I think that's very that's very significant because Voltaire was sort of like the saint of the revolution at the time, and uh, that Levy was so strongly critical of him is uh, important to look at and think about because Levy was a very strong social critic, uh, very anti uh, re not just anti revolution but anti democracy, which Crowley brings up again later. Crowley was very anti democracy as well. Levy called it uh, the rule of the in ignorant over the intelligent. And um, there is something to be said about that. It's interesting to look at what we can and cannot criticize in our society. And democracy is one of those things that you cannot criticize or people rain on you. So that's what I, what I always like to think about is like, who is the devil, really? And who is the gods? Um, Jung says that, uh, that like, you, you know who your gods are by who you get, who, what offends you. And there are a lot of people, it's very fashionable to walk around these days and say that nothing offends me. You know, nothing upsets me, but it's like, yeah, that's not true. You know, there's always something. Something's going to get under your skin, and that's the evidence of who the real God is and who you really worship.
I mean, there can be someone even considering themselves to be a devout Christian who uh, doesn't get offended if you make jokes about Jesus, but maybe they're a huge Tool fan. And Lord knows if you say anything about Maynard James Keenan, then all of a sudden you're, you're the devil. Um, this, uh, this religious climate also led to an um, influx. Um, a lot has been talked about um, sort of satanic cults that existed in, in France at the time, and this was a big deal in the church at the time. Uh, where priests would, not having a source of regular income, um, sell their services as occultists to uh, people with money to try to make money for themselves. And that was, that was a huge sort of current of what was happening. And Levy was very strongly opposed to that. And it led him to kind of believe that the church had been infested with a sort of satanic virus or satanic germ that um, was creating a huge problem. Now this is, Levy's work uh, marks a very interesting turning point in occultism because although he wrote, had occult writings and spoke about Kabbalistic stuff and stuff that would traditionally um, lead you to be um, imprisoned or tormented by papal authorities or whatever, uh, it was his political writings that landed him in prison. Um, and this is a current that continues to this day. Uh, there's sort of a lot of people in different occult communities that like to pretend that they're going to get persecuted for their wacky beliefs or whatever. This is very rarely the case, I find. I think that it's overblown. It's people who want to believe that they're going to be persecuted. But in actuality, uh, if you go against the grain in a more political sense, you're more likely to receive a reaction than uh, just like practicing witchcraft or whatever, whatever like that. Um, so this is kind of like when this turns around because er before this, and this uh, this isn't a coincidence. Um, the the reason for this is because uh, after the French Revolution, this touched off a lot of uh, political reconfiguration all around Europe, and the church lost a great deal of power in most places. Um, Levy was really the first to expound upon the idea that the occult should be treated like a science. Um, John Dee definitely treated it that way, uh, but he didn't really write his theories out. Um, or explain to people why it should be the case or how he was doing it. Uh, Le Levy makes a, a big point of saying, you know, saying that this should be treated in the same way that you would treat any other science. Let's say, like you do a magical experiment the same way that you do an experiment in chemistry or an experiment in physics. Um, Crowley picks up on this and runs with it, and that's sort of why Crowley is the um, the ultimate combination because he not only explains his theory and explains his practice, but we also have his diaries, we have his thoughts, and we have you know what he was going through at the time, which is the thing that um, is kind of like, like, like the missing parts from both Dee and Levy are there in Crowley's work. Um, really the only time that we get any kind of personal stuff um, from Levy is when he talks about his necromantic work with Apollonius of Tiana um, and just explains like when he's trying to explain necromancy and his uh, um, doctrine and ritual of transcendental magic. Um, and that's really, the, that's literally, the only reason I bring that up specifically is it's like the, literally the only personal nugget that you get from Levy. Um, and for a lot of the case, his magic tends to be about um, making yourself up to be the thing and whatever it is that you're trying to invoke. And it's a very simple principle. Uh, later on, the Golden Dawn used his work as um, sort of a template to do their stuff. And they solved some of the problems that he came up with um, in their system, and we're going to get to that. Uh, but the, the number one thing that Levy sort of teaches, and 